Thank you. So I'm Janet Chapman. Um, I took over as chair of Tanzania Development Trust at the AGM last year. Um, so I'd like to briefly talk about what Tanzania Development Trust does and what we've been up to over the last year. So it's been a very busy year. Um, we have a new website. Thank you to our amazing volunteer, Kathy. Please do check it out if you haven't seen it. Um, we've also set up a shop where you can buy the Christmas cards that we um, always sell, um, but also some new good gift products, um, such as chickens and trees and with much more to come. So please do have a look. We also started a monthly newsletter. So um, you can sign up for this on the website or if you're a member of Britain Tanzania Society, you will get it automatically. Thank you. Um, so if you haven't already seen our annual report, then please do. It's on our website and I'll also put a link in the chat. And we have been very active on social media. So um, if you use Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, then please have a look at, at um, our channels. And we've also got some really great videos now on our YouTube channel, um, including some really good highlights, again, done by Kathy. So please have a look at those. So our priorities are sustainable access to water for rural communities, which is a huge issue in the areas where we operate. Um, small income generating projects, particularly for rural women and youth, such as beekeeping, tailoring, agriculture and so on, and also girls education, which is particularly hostels for government secondary schools. So these are the areas in Tanzania where we operate, and in each of these areas we have local volunteers on the ground who are really embedded in their communities and understand the issues well, and we work very closely together with them and with our UK-based project officers. And there's more information about this on our website, plus the details of all of our committee members. We also try to um, facilitate partnerships with other organizations who share our aims. So Partners in Excellence um, are an amazing organization. You'll hear from them shortly. They're doing um, really great work around school improvement and school leadership. So we're delighted that many of the schools we work with are also working with them. We've just started working with I Am The Code, which is aiming to enable girls in particular um, to learn coding and other skills. And very recently, we were delighted that some of our schools in, and including girls at the FGM safe houses took part in events for Day of the Girl um, in which they were able to ask questions of the founder, Lady Mariam Jame, and also hear from mentors from all around the world, including IT professionals such as Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook and Bill Gates. So we're looking forward to further um, cooperations with them. And if, again, if you'd like to know more about any of these programs, please do get in touch. Um, we're also um, working with Femina HIP, so they provide uh, resources to many of the schools that we work with, including free magazines, um, TV channels, um, downloaded material, etc. So a really great resource too. And finally, we've started working recently with the um, Association for Mathematics Teaching, um, who are based in Kenya. They've done a lot of work around maths and science education. They've done maths camps, which some of our, um, some teachers from schools that we're working with have uh, participated in in the, in the past, but also they're now doing much more virtual work. So we're really great, grateful to them for organizing seminars on Zoom that have been really useful. Um, talking about different materials that are, are available for maths and physics teachers. This is really important because in many of the schools we work with, there is a real lack of maths and, and science teachers. 
Um, and often they are temporary teachers who haven't had the benefit from a lot of training. So many of you know Roby Samwelly, uh, rep from Mara, extremely well. I know many of you have had the opportunity to, to meet her and to also see the film about her work in the name of your daughter. So if you don't know, she is an FGM survivor and activist who's doing amazing work in Mara region. And this is her website, please do check it out. Um, but recently she has been elected to um, the NACONGO, which is the National Council for NGOs. And she is part of the National Steering Committee and she's responsible for capacity development. So in this short film, she explains a bit more about that. Hi everyone, my name is Robi Samuel. I'm working with Hope for Girls in the Women in Tanzania. On my new role at the Congo, I'm the chairperson of capacity building for NGOs in Tanzania. My role is to make sure that all the NGOs have capacitated and they have good knowledge regarding the work they are doing. So our plan is to conduct capacity building assessment for NGOs in Tanzania and then develop a capacity development plan for NGOs in Tanzania based on the needs assessment report. Then it's the implementation of the NGOs capacity. As the Congo, I'm also representing NGOs from Mara region. Through my committee of capacity building for NGOs in Tanzania, is to make sure that we link all issues concerning capacity building with the government so that finally all NGOs are working with good knowledge, with good capacity in order to reach the objectives and Tanzanians. So thank you to Roby, and I think she's on the call. So if you have any questions, please do ask. Um, and if you want to contact her, if you're involved with an NGO in Tanzania, then I'm sure she'd be delighted to help you. Hi. So um, many of you also have um, met Benedicto Hosea, our local rep from Kigoma Rural. Um, and he, he, we were delighted that he actually spoke at our AGM in, when it was in person in 2018, and also spoke at the Houses of Parliament um, at the APPG organized by Jeremy Lefroy, as you can see here. So he's been doing some fantastic work in um, Kigoma, particularly with his organization Mboni Yavijana, Vijana, Eyes of the Youth, um, and they're doing some amazing work with microfinance, with, with women's empowerment, with training um, farmers, with agricultural processing, but also with access to water. So here is a short video showing that how they are bringing water to Kigoma. He has developed a method of um, low cost water supply, which is a huge issue. And here is a sh short film about that.
And thank you to Kathy for, um, again, for doing that great film. So as part of our Christmas campaign um, with Big Give, we're hoping to raise money for 10 um, boreholes and wells um, at a cost of 1500 pounds each. So um, please do support us if you can. So the next um, local rep um, who is, is here, I believe. So if you have any questions for him, please do put them in the chat, uh, is Ezekiel Kasanka, um, who is our rep for um, Simiu and Tabora, who is building an open school. Um, so here is some information about that. Hello, my name is Ezekiel Kasanka, the founder of Tumaini Education Program that is enrolling and enabling teen mothers like this one you are seeing here to regain their education outside the public school system. As is well known, when students uh, when become pregnant uh, lose their right to education. And of course, there is very narrow chance for them to gain their education outside the public school system. This is Memo from Masa Tatake. She was expelled out and forbidden from returning to school after becoming pregnant when she was in class 11. Now she back to school through to my education program. And education is important for her, her child, and the community as well. She planned to become a teacher and serve her community. I decided to come up with the Tumaini Education Program uh, that is creating a second chance for these teen mothers. Um, so many of you also know, um, I've spoken before about the mapping project, Crowd to Map, and I'm very glad that there's quite a few um, of our volunteers in, um, in the meeting today. So this is a project which is um, mapping rural Tanzania into OpenStreetMap, which is an open source um, map. And anybody who has an internet connection can get involved. So we're doing this for um, better navigation for community development, but also to help protect girls from female genital mutilation. If you'd like to know more, please get in touch or check out the website there. And actually we've been going six years. So next Sunday we're having an event. Um, so if you would like to know more, please um, do come along and I'll put the link in the chat shortly. So if you have any questions about any of that, then please do get in touch. Or if you'd like to get more involved with Tanzania Development Trust in any way, again, please get in touch. Thank you. So now I'd like to hand over to um, Martin from Pixel. So Elizabeth, please unmute him. Um, <laughs> if I can find him. Uh, so what are you logged? What's he logged in as? Do we know? M Martin Rainsworth and Phil Hawkins. Martin Rainsworth. I'm asking him to unmute and Phil Rainsworth. And Phil Hawkins. Hawkins, got you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, and thanks, Janet, for giving us the opportunity to speak. Um, Pixel International, we're a group of secondary school leaders in the UK who share ideas with schools in Tanzania and other countries. And we've been working with link schools of the Tanzanian Development Trust for some five or six years now. Uh, a couple of themes we're going to talk about today. One is how we link with the schools, what we do, and how we foster leadership development in them. So Janet, next slide, please. Uh, 
Okay, so we our prime focus is on those gateway qualifications that enable pupils to pass their primary school leavers exam and their certificate of secondary education. Because without those qualifications, if you don't pass primary, you don't go to secondary. If you don't get a good grade at the end of secondary, you can't go on to A level or vocational. So we seek to work with school leaders to have an impact on attainment through the implementation of known successful strategies that have been tried in the UK and elsewhere. In a minute, Phil will talk about the impact on sustainable school improvement through leadership coaching. Um, but if we can have the next slide, please, Janet. Some of the successes that we've noted in the link schools, the Tanzanian Development Trust link schools, um, their pass rate at CSEE last year went up from 78% to 87%. And schools with some particularly good improvements, um, you can see on the screen there. But we speak with the leaders of schools such as these and ask them how, we how they did it. And we share their ideas with hundreds of other schools in, in Tanzania. So we've been collecting ideas for some five or six years now. And we work with over 1,400 schools in Morogoro, Kilimanjaro, Rukwa regions. But great successes to see these schools and how they've transformed the lives of many of their students by getting a higher pass rate. Uh, how was this achieved? Next slide, please, Janet. Um, research shows that secondary school leadership is the best locus for school improvement. It's the leaders of the school who generate the motivation amongst their teachers to actually achieve the goals they set themselves. So strong leadership. Um, we are able to assist with revision resources, focusing on past paper exam questions. We can also assist with the provision of academic data so that schools can build on the prior attainment of their students. And through mock exams and other tests, um, they feed back to students on where their gaps are in their learning. And then well before the exams, they prepare them to fill those gaps. And then we celebrate the successes. So looking for the year ahead, Janet, next slide please. Schools in the Tanzanian Development Trust family of schools, they've already made good use of their Form 2 national results from two years ago. They've set targets for their Form 4 CSE exams that start in two, two or three weeks time. They've looked at the mock exam results. They've set up catch and revision sessions for students. And when the results come out in January, we hope that all those linked schools with the Tanzanian Development Trust will have lots to celebrate. But we're finding that by focusing on those gateway exam results and then moving heaven and earth to achieve the goals that schools set for themselves, that sharp focus using data can be profoundly successful and you get into a virtuous circle of the results go up, people are delighted, they want to do more and share the word. But it does depend crucially on strong school leadership. So Phil, his, um, who leads on that for us with Impixel International, will say a few words about what he's doing with some of the TDT schools within Tanzania. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Martin, and good, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you. As Martin has said, uh, I'm responsible for the leadership development coaching and we're thrilled to be working with a number of schools uh, across Tanzania. We use a tried and tested model based on um, a mixture of international best practice and also valuing local best practice as well. Because this is re re really important point here, that in order to help a school sustainably improve, we need to build leadership capacity. And I know from, uh, you know, Sir Stephen is on, on record as saying that it's really important to reduce vulnerability and risk. And we believe that, that uh, investing in leadership does both of those as it builds leadership capacity uh, into the future. And so that is all part of our model. Um, we use uh, a mixture of online and then supported through Zoom coaching uh, sessions. We've got ebooks, we've got workbooks as well. Uh, we start off with the leader, they're the key agents of change. Janet, could you go on to the next slide, please? Uh, we then take the leaders through our teacher development course, which looks at really an international quality standard 
that is very, very achievable, whatever the context or culture that really, really helps improve the quality of teaching and learning day in, day out in the classroom. So the, the school leaders go through the leadership course and then the teacher training course. Uh, and then Janet, can you do the next slide, please? And then uh, the leaders are then uh, equipped and skilled to then deliver the teacher development course to their own staff. And we support them in, in doing that. So it's, it's that trickle down uh, effect of training. And then the, the, the final slide, um, Janet, and just to say of the list that uh, Martin indicated before, we just started with um, the, those two schools. Uh, they have already gone through phase one. You can see they've made significant improvement and we are now piloting our phase two with these schools. And we're really excited about the openness and the initiative and the energy and the optimism that our Tanzanian schools are bringing with them. And we are learning lot, lots from them too. Thanks very much. Thank you, Phil. And I know, I think Alpha is here, if any, who from Ekondo School, if anybody wants to ask um, him any questions in the chat. Uh, Janet, uh, we have one question to you as a result of that. Can the water project be done anywhere in Tanzania? as Benedicto does it? So it, it does depend on the um, conditions, the, the rock conditions. So it, it's what, it is working particularly well in Kigoma. However, Benedicto's team have also trained people in um, Singida to, to do this. So if, yes, yes, it can work, but it does depend on the, on the conditions. If you have, very um, strong rock, it's going to be very difficult. Um, it takes them up to six days to, drill, to, to do the hand drilling. Um, so it, it is depends, somehow dependent on the geological conditions. But if you want to know more, please do get in touch. Um, we can talk um, generally. Right, thank you very much, Janet. And thank you for all the work that TDT does, not only what we've just seen, but much that goes on behind the scenes as well. I've got to make myself visible. Right, we're there. right um, our next speaker was to be Gideon Malawa from Tuheida, but he doesn't appear to be with us. So uh, if he is, could please send me a chat. But meantime, I'd like to invite Ben Taylor to talk to us about Tanzanian affairs. Hi everyone, thanks Elizabeth. Uh, and I'd like to add my thanks for our guest speakers today as well. I think they made some excellent contributions, some, some very good points there. Um, yeah, speaking briefly about Tanzanian affairs, um, Tanzanian Affairs is the, the journal of, of the Britain Tanzania Society. We publish three times a year, and essentially we, our goal is to, to uh, provide readers largely in the UK, but elsewhere in the world as well, anybody with an interest in Tanzania, with a, with a solid summary of the news from Tanzania for the previous uh, three to four months. Um, as I say, we publish three times a year in January, May and uh, September, although that timetable uh, has been a little uh, flexible of late. Um, that is certainly our goal to publish on those, in those three months. Um, over the last few years, last year in particular, uh, two big stories that we've focused quite a lot of attention on. Uh, one has been the political environment within Tanzania with the, the death of the former president, President Magufuli, uh, as he was the sitting president at the time, in fact, uh, and the, the the inauguration and early actions of President Buhu Hassan uh, in, as his replacement. That's been one of our big stories. Uh, the second has been obviously the, the coronavirus pandemic. So we've had quite a lot of uh, coverage of that. Mercifully, the, the pandemic does not appear to have hit Tanzania as hard as it has 
uh, many countries in, in Europe and North America and elsewhere. Uh, it's not entirely known why that is the case. It may be something to do with the age profile of the population in Tanzania, um, but as yet, uh, the best uh, analysis, the, the epidemiologists and so on, has, has not reached a conclusive uh, verdict on why countries like Tanzania have, have got away uh, lightly by under the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I would like also to slightly naughtily uh, steal this opportunity a little bit to, to add a little bit of detail or context to some of the things that our speakers earlier mentioned. Uh, in particular, the, the the High Commissioner in Tanzania mentioned that UK aid to Tanzania has, has reduced a little bit uh, and the UK aid is trying to uh, kind of manage that, that reduced spend as effectively as possible to get maximum impact for the, for the money. I have no doubt that that is the, the uh, goal, but I think it is worth just adding a bit of context to understand the scale of the cuts to UK aid to Tanzania. Uh, in particular, this is using the British government's own figures in 2015, the British government provided £205 million pounds to Tanzania. Uh, in 2021-22, the current financial year, uh, the budget is £28 million. So it's roughly 15% of what it was just six years ago, the, the UK aid budget to, to Tanzania. It's a massive, massive cut. Uh, and I don't think it necessarily does uh, the British government any credit that that is the case. Um, I also think it, it, it's worth being quite transparent about the scale of the cuts when they are quite as big as that. Um, a second point, I'd just like to clarify something that was said earlier as well. Yes, under the new president, the political environment has changed and indeed the handling of the coronavirus pandemic has changed. Just brief points on each of those. On COVID, while Tanzania has indeed released some data on tests and positive cases and so on. Uh, Tanzania has only twice in the entire year of 2021 released any data on COVID case numbers or uh, uh, testing numbers and so on. Uh, it did that twice in, I think it was in, in around about August, some, something in that kind of time, uh, shortly before the IMF committed to releasing funds for Tanzania to recover from the pandemic. Uh, whether there's a link between the two uh, is uh, uh, an open question, but I would suggest that the two are probably not unconnected. Uh, Tanzania hasn't released any more data on, on COVID case numbers for about a month now. Um, so it's, it's an improvement, but it's, it's, it's slow steps. It's not a radical restructuring of how the COVID response is being organised in Tanzania. And similarly, on, on the state of Tanzanian democracy, uh, I think it's, it's worth noting that despite having a different president in place, there are some concerning trends that continue. Yes, some things on the, the, the political environment have improved considerably uh, in the, the few months that the president has been in office. Uh, nevertheless, there are some concerning things still in place, in particular, the, there's a, an ongoing uh, case against the leader of the opposition, Freeman Mboe, the leader of uh, the opposition party, Chadema, which uh, it's not for me to say whether it's politically motivated or not, but there are worrying signs that the justice system uh, does not appear to be acting with impartiality in, in this particular case. It's never a good sign if the leader of the opposition is arrested held without charge for several days uh, in contravention of the, the law, the constitution of Tanzania and so on. Uh, and the case is, is still ongoing in, I think the, 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 the least we can say is that it's, it's less than credible uh, evidence that appears to be being presented against him. Uh, I, I won't say anything further than that, but it, it's certainly not a great sign for the state of Tanzanian democracy at the present time. Thank you very much. Hand uh, ben, back I've got one question. Could the okay. aid cut you mentioned be covered in Tanzanian affairs with analysis of the consequences? Who suffered? Yes, I absolutely in, intend to cover this in the next issue. The, the most recent figures, the 28 million figure that I uh, gave a few minutes ago, that, that was came out just a few weeks ago. 
uh, since the previous issue of Tanzanian Affairs was, was put together. So I will certainly be focusing on that a little bit uh, to see what, what the consequences are for, for both for organizations that were previously receiving and spending that, that money, um, but also for the Tanzanian uh, population more generally, what the consequences will likely be. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ben. And thank you for all your work on Tanzanian affairs and for your team. And yes, sorry, Elizabeth, can I just finally say one more thing? We are looking for more contributors. So if anybody is interested in contributing to Tanzanian affairs, particularly people with an interest in health or in natural resources in the, in the uh, mining and energy side of natural resources, uh, then I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. So now our other publication, the newsletter, over to our very new editor, Jennifer Sharp. Hi, that's me. I took over the newsletter just for the last issue, and um, it goes out at the same time as Tanzanian Affairs, three times a year. And the difference is it's for members and it's not political or business orientated. So if you have any news about your organization, your work or charity that you're, that, that you're involved with, please send it to me. Um, normally people write about 500 words and send some photographs as well. So if you can do that, it'd be much appreciated. But other kinds of messages, anything that you want to share with the members, um, I will find a space for. Um, and that's basically it. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And now we move on to the work which different members are doing under their own steam. Uh, so I'd like now to hand over to Kevin Curley, who works with street children. And I also need to bring up a PowerPoint for his benefit. So, Kevin, if you'd like to start talking while I bring your screen up. Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. This year, we've made progress in our efforts to find ways of educating vulnerable boys and girls and giving them opportunities to get off the street. Thanks to donations from Jane Hamer and several other BTS members, we've enabled young people to get off the streets in Singida and Kasulu. In Singida, Hamza Rajabu, who's with us today, the representative of TDT in that region, is supporting several boys to take short vocational courses in the local Vita College. Vita, I beg your pardon. Already Khalid, in yellow, has completed a driving course and is now making a modest living driving a Bajaji. He earns enough now to rent a room in Singida and is sharing it with another young guy, Gabriel, pictured here, who's left the street and is studying car mechanics. Gabriel will be given a toolbox full of hand tools after he completes his course. In Kasulu, Rebecca Rocky, who runs the Hope Street Children's Centre, has arranged for six young men and one young woman to take two-year courses at a boarding college in Masoma run by Catholic Sisters. They're taking courses in sewing, cookery, vehicle mechanics and masonry. Each student will be given the tools or equipment they need to start earning a living at the end of the course. Later, the government vocational colleges we found to be pretty inflexible and they won't allow students to take courses of more than six months unless they've completed form four in secondary school. Most of the young people we're helping have not been to secondary school or if they have, they haven't got through to form four. Nor will Beta Colleges admit students younger than 18 years, which leaves us with the dilemma of what to do with them until they reach that age. But by contrast, the Catholic College in Masoma will admit them at 16 and doesn't insist on secondary education. All the children do need, though, to have basic literacy skills, and this remains a barrier for some on the streets. And again, we're trying to find ways of overcoming that. The, uh, the good Catholic sisters of Masoma have been very patient as our youngsters 
struggle to adapt from life on the streets to life in a religious boarding college. There have been fights in the classroom and the communion bread was stolen from the church and other misdemeanors. But through it all, the Catholic sisters have kept their senses of humor and things have now settled down. So now it's good progress. With their training in practical skills, a startup toolbox, continued advice and practical help from Hamza in Singida, from Rebecca in Kasulu, there's a good prospect that these young people will be able to learn, earn a modest living, rent a room and not return to the streets. I'd just like, while I'm here, to thank Brian Medcalf, the TDT treasurer, for administering all the private donations and claiming the gift aid. Brian is an unsung hero, so I'll sing his name today. A short course and a startup toolbox costs 200 pounds plus gift aid. If anybody would like to sponsor a street boy or a street girl, give them the opportunity to turn their life round, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Kevin, for this tremendous work that you've been doing. And I'll just leave that slide there for a second if anybody would like to contact Kevin to find out more or to volunteer their support. Right, I now need to stop sharing that as I invite Louise Johnson to talk about Ntimbanjayo uh, Memorial Schools of Excellence. Again, I have got a PowerPoint to share with you on that. Louise, are you there? Yes, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak about our project in uh, Namanditi in the Ruvuma region of Tanzania. We've been working there since 2007 on a school project which initially was only to be a primary school. But then of course when we finished the primary school we had something like 55 sponsored children and we realised they were going to need a good secondary school to go on to and there simply wasn't one in the region. So we have now built a secondary school, which was rather more than we anticipated doing when we began this whole project. And by next year, at the end of the year, our first form four of children will be students, will be looking for some kind of further education. So I've been very interested in listening to the other speakers and have noted all their contacts because I'll be getting in touch um, about things like vocational skill programs or training that can be done and I'm already researching into what's happening in um, universities, what's on offer for students there. We have one very bright student, Mwaja, who's getting straight A's and um, she wants to be a doctor so we're trying to facilitate that and I've just um, heard today that her sponsor, who's very elderly, her son is going to take her on the um, training for um, Mwaja for the next three years, which will give her a nursing um, training. And then she can apply to be a doctor after that. The um, images I'm showing don't really need much explanation. Um, they were the, the new um, classrooms that we built, also uh, the, the laboratory, which um, is fully equipped, uh, something which is a rarity really in uh, Tanzanian schools. And I have visited many of them in my um, trips across there. So um, I know that this one is something a bit special. So the current primary seven um, have just graduated. These are some pictures of them. And uh, of this small class, you see where our, our classes are very small. We are minimizing them in that there's to be no more than 35 in any class for primary and 25 for secondary. Um, the challenge of that is that we were trying to get our secondary school registered and it should have been registered at the beginning of the year. But um, and interestingly, when someone was asking about the, how does the government um, react or support or in any way engage with private schools, because this is a CBO um, and therefore not a, a government school. Uh, the answer to that is well, what they do is they keep adding on extra requirements. So when you're trying to get your school registered, they suddenly tell you you need um, so many science laboratories, which you hadn't initially um, assumed. 
then they tell you you need a fence around the whole of the school, although it's in a, another, it's in the same area that the primary school is in, and we didn't really want to separate the two of them. Sorry, these slides are going at a rate. I didn't realize <laughs> I thought they would be manually put on. Anyway, um, at the, so not exactly cooperative as far as the inspections went, but we have finally um, satisfied all their um, desires and we now have our fully operating secondary school and the children are attending that school. In the interim, when we couldn't, when we weren't registered, we had to register our children for exams for their um, form two and form four when it comes up through the local nearest secondary school, which was a very poor school. It was completely underachieving. Well, in the three years since they've had our students there, they've suddenly become one of the best schools in the region. So I think that is a good indication that our primary school is giving a foundation that um, is, is of excellence, which is what they were aiming for. Um, so in a very short time, we've gone from being a nursery primary school to now um, a, a secondary school as well. But there are things we still need, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, I'm trying to keep this very short because I was told it would only be two minutes, and I thought, well, that's not going to get me very much said at all. Um, what I want to talk about, though, today is not so much about the school. It's about a kind of um, related project that we are developing in one of the office spaces. We have built an admin block next to the secondary school and it was always our intention at some point to create an archive which would record and set the record straight for in many ways for what happened with the Ujima villages. So um, at the moment anyone who had volunteered in the Rivuma um, Ujima villages in the 1960s and that includes people like um, Professor Virginia uh, DK, uh, David Bowdery, who was uh, an engineer, and uh, we're wor they're working in connection with other volunteers, but also people like um, Method Nigeri and other friends in Tanzania, and the villages, they're going back to the villages, recording people, interviewing them, and creating a, a pictorial and a, a, a written and recorded um, history of what happened. And of course, we have um, Ralph Ibbott's books as well to, to actually um, include in all of that. And we're hoping that at some point a student from Edinburgh University might digitize all of the um, information, all of the media that we are collecting together. And that is still in the, the, the process of trying to be negotiated. Uh, meanwhile, Virginia Dickey is creating posters and um, they will be displayed in the archive on the walls. And this will be a resource, not just for our own school, so that they understand the history of Timbanjao, who the school is uh, named after, but also of the relationship to the Ujima villages, of the role of people like Ralph and Nori, um, and also of Nereri and his theories um, that will all be part and parcel of the archive. So the children at our school will benefit, but so will any other interested student. It will be an open resource. So this is um, something I haven't spoken about before and I haven't written about in the magazine, but it's something that because we have finished the secondary school now, although we still have other things to build, um, it is something that was, is now ongoing and we have a graphic designer who's taking the posters that uh, Virginia has put together and is going to um, design them in a way so that the layout looks very professional. And um, to finish off, what we need for our own project would simply be um, we need another dormitory for the girls and um, we need a roof for the dining hall and we need a second nursery classroom. Um, but really, we are getting towards the end of this project, I feel now, and a lot of the work that needs done in the future will be covered by the income that the school will be bringing in in fees. And gradually, our 55 um, sponsored children will go through the system, and that will be replaced by a scholarship program, which I'm looking into setting up. So people who have sponsored a child, they have the option of carrying on, seeing that child on to further education if they wish. But also, they could just contribute instead to a fund that would be used so that other children like those that wouldn't have had any education and those uh, ones that we've given an education to could be selected 
and could then uh, come to the school and be educated up until uh, Form 4, which is as far as our school is going to go. Okay, thank you very much for listening. I don't know if that was two minutes. It was probably an awful lot more. Um, but <laughs> anyway, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much indeed, Louise, and for supplying some good slides to share with us. Um, now I have a presentation from Ian Rankin, Christian Engineers for Development, when I find it. Um, ah, that was the problem, I have to go back. And I need to share this screen. Hi, my name is Ian Rankin. Thanks for the invitation to say a little bit about what I'm doing in Tanzania. I'm not a proper member of BTS, but I am living here. I first came in 1987 and spent four years in Wands as an architect for the Arctica Inland Church. And since then, I've returned several times working on behalf of Christian Engineers in Development, a small engineering charity. Two years ago, I presented a rainwater harvesting training course in Kibaha with the Africa Inland Church. And earlier this year, I married the translator from that course. So that is why Tanzania has now become home. My connection with BTS goes back to 2007 when I gave a talk to the Scotland group on behalf of CED. This led to Christopher Hall asking for CED's help with Zanzibar Cathedral. One of our engineers visited and the problems with the building were quite grave. Eventually though, it was World Monuments Fund that took the project forward, but they retained myself and a colleague as consultants. So we did manage to keep our involvement with the cathedral and see that project through. The Anglicans in Zanzibar have another church called St. John's in Gwene, and it too needs conservation and it would be great if they can find funding so that we can do that. But the main work within CED is water supply. Our biggest ever project was at Tawaga, Ringa. It was a 1.2 million euro project funded by the EU. It connects eight villages to a supply from the Little Raha River through 40 kilometers of PVC pipe. The scheme came into operation in 2011 and was opened by President Equity. These days I'm advising a Canadian organization for building a secondary school with Africa Inland Church Pandy near Tanga. Having left Tanzania in 1991, it's great working with a modern contractor and seeing the improvement in quality and just your organization that's available now. My main interest though within CED has been promoting harassment water tanks. We're using a design based on the practical action pumpkin tank. The shape appeals to people and is theoretically more efficient than a cylindrical tank. First of all, a steel skeleton is erected. Then this is covered with chicken wire. After that, it's plastered and then the steel skeleton is removed. There's some finishing work done and that's it, that's the time. We also train, we also train people to make a smaller, cheaper, unreinforced time. And this one uses sacks with sawdust as the mold. We have by now created five groups in Tanzania, plus three in Rwanda. Training is always well received. But when the training stops, the tank building tends to stop too. We're working with the Anglicans in Kagera to try and get around this problem. They have already been working with communities and have trained some to build tanks. And some of these groups also have been doing community savings schemes. So if we feed the community savings and the tanks together with a little help from CED at the beginning, we're hopeful that people will gradually start building tanks as a solution to their water needs without the need for support. The tanks are cheaper and more robust than plastic tanks and the water tank quality is better too. So if any of the BTS members are thinking of purchasing a plastic tank, perhaps we could discuss whether a cement tank might be a better option for them. Please see me and I can discuss it with you. I go back to Scotland next week to see family. 
when he turned Nazia and I plan to build a house near Dar es Salaam. Perhaps one day we'll meet someone here or in the UK. Thank you. Right, so that was Ian Rankin's presentation, and now I am turning to Willie Fulton, uh, I believe, to speak about the mango tree. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> uh, can anyone see me? Well, they can see you if they make right. you going to speak of you. <clears throat> right. Um, uh, first of all, I'd just like to say how wonderful it is to see so many old friends, BTS friends, on, on this Zoom meeting. It's a couple of years since we've been able to communicate, so it's great. Um, uh, yes, the mango tree. I'm going to start with a little bit of background as to how I uh, and my wife Gail became involved with Tanzania. We started in 1968 as VSO volunteers. I was a, a newly qualified accountant and went to work for a subsidiary of the um, uh, Tanzania Development Corporation, and Gail is a physio and worked at the Muhumbili on a Red Cross project for polio children. She always says that um, she got the, uh, the posting and then they had to find a job for me. Anyway, um, it was a wonderful experience and we felt that when we finished our time with VSO, we had uh, gained far more personally ourselves than we had ever given to Tanzania. And we said then that as and when we retired, we'd come back and do something uh, where we had hoped that we'd be able to do something for the country. Um, <clears throat> we bought an old VW Combi, shipped it to India, drove around India, and drove all the way home. I joined the family uh, engineering company. Um, one of the products we made was uh, it, uh, the sugar industry, so I had to return many times to East Africa for uh, visiting sugar factories. Uh, during this time, I became a trustee of the most fantastic organization, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, and I'm, I'm being totally objective when I say that. And Jeremy, who is another trustee, will bear that in mind. And so will Sir Stephen. He was a trustee for many years as well. Um, and whenever I traveled for my company, I'd go and see research projects at the school. And I was at a project uh, where we were monitoring the life expectancy of uh, people who are HIV positive in Entebbe uh, before the days of antiretroviral drugs. And a group of people, of young people aged between about 25 and 40 were making a presentation to me. And I realized that I was the only person in the room who would still be alive 18 months later. And I thought, well, what will happen to all their kids when they've, when they've snuffed it? So um, Gail and I then started looking around uh, parts of Africa and India for examples of good practice in orphan care. And we came across a project in Malawi where a Malawian was getting funding from uh, returned Peace Corps volunteers to support orphans in, the, in their villages, <clears throat> working through village volunteers. So keeping it <clears throat> very, very low cost, no uh, very low overheads, uh, and was therefore able to get uh, a massive amount of orphans into school, and, uh, and that was the, sort of the way, way forward. We decided to copy him, and uh, we worked with uh, my oldest Tanzanian friend, whose family had, had been very seriously affected by HIV. Most of his siblings <clears throat> had, had died of, of HIV. And we came to work in Kiela, because Kiela on being on the border post with, with Malawi had a very, very high uh, rate of, um, of, of, of death rate. Um, it was absolutely pathetic when we arrived. The, it, you'd go through these villages in Kiela with only old people and young children. Uh, the whole of the economic um, uh, the active people had been, had been wiped out. So we started by getting the children back into school uh, and uh, by giving them uniform, <clears throat> uniforms and uh, giving them exercise books and pens and pencils. Uh, and that built up to um, pretty quickly and pretty massively. And at the other side, uh, we found that the, mon <clears throat> the money was coming in very quickly. Um, it was a time when Tony Blair was, had his Commission for Africa 
uh, virtually every news uh, reel ended with some story about an HIV orphan. Uh, and so we wrote 700 letters to uh, anyone on our contacts list, asking them to give us 100 pounds a year under gift aid and perhaps every year. Uh, and that had an over 60% positive uptake. And really that's still the basis of our, our supporters today. And this was nearly 20 years ago. Um, and <clears throat> we've got one or two very, very um, generous and very wealthy uh, supporters who have supported our major projects. Um, so, um, uh, the, so we, we've, during this time, we've supported about 18,000 uh, orphans with their education uh, in Tanzania. But of course, they went on from primary school, then to secondary school, and then to tertiary education. Uh, so uh, we've heard about vocation, the lack of vocational training uh, in Tanzania. We, we invested uh, one and a quarter million pounds in a state-of-the-art building in Kiela as a <clears throat> vocational training college, where we have facilities to train about 900 students a year in masonry, tailoring, hairdressing, motor mechanics, electrical engineering, IT, journalism, accounting, hotel and tourism, driving instruction, welding, and many, many other skills. Um, we've recently handed this over to VETA, uh, and they have, uh, have taken charge of this. So uh, we're, we're getting the benefits of the <clears throat> sponsorship from the, from the government. Uh, in 2006, uh, because the money was rolling in, we uh, spread into Kenya, uh, and we've supported about um, 12,000 uh, orphans there in the, doing exactly the same, the same work uh, uh, near Lake Victoria. And we're currently building a girls' boarding uh, uh, secondary school there. Uh, during this time, in about 2010, uh, I became chairman of BTS. And uh, in 2014, I think, I hosted with Jeremy, uh, President Kikweti, at a wonderful occasion at the FCO. Uh, however, <clears throat> uh, very sadly, uh, in 2012, I realized that my old friend was, had been um, misappropriating some funds, not, not enormous funds, but he had been uh, misappropriating. And whilst the loss of money was sad, the saddest thing was the loss of trust. Uh, and that really you know, gutted, uh, gutted everyone associated with him. It was so unexpected. Uh, and I therefore had to, uh, uh, had to dispense with his services. <clears throat> but unfortunately, uh, he had an important local political position uh, and our local political uh, local uh, MP in 2015 needed his support to become renominated, so I was made a prohibited immigrant. Um, it was had absolutely nothing to do with me. There were all sorts of silly charges uh, brought about with spying and uh, associations with, with Chadema and things, but which were nonsense. Uh, but nearly seven years later. I'm still a prohibited immigrant, but that hasn't stopped us uh, from carrying on with our work. Um, we're still supporting many students in Kiela. Um, uh, we're finishing off those in secondary school, but those in tertiary uh, are still getting our support. And we're producing, you know, we've produced thousands of teachers, uh, lots of uh, doctors and dentists and nurses and civil engineers, electrical engineers, every, every, every sort of uh, lawyers, accountants, bankers. It's great. Um, and it continues to be great, great fun. Um, we see today in Kiela, one of the big challenges is you'll remember um, about 15 years ago, there was an enormous expansion of secondary schools. Well, all their pit latrines now, most of them are not working. And so the effect of that is that girls are not staying in secondary school for the whole month, and most a lot of them are dropping out. We want to um, we want to replace those pit latrines with modern, up to date uh, latrines, and uh, we'd very much like to do so. 
unfortunately, our, our, um, our major donors are saying until such time as I can get back to Tanzania, they're not allowing their money to be used. Uh, <clears throat> the orphans of Kiela <clears throat> have lost over a million pounds of support over the last seven years, sadly. So um, I'd, I'd be interested to know if anyone else has got this problem in other parts of Tanzania of, the, of those new secondary school toilets resulting in girls dropping out of school. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Willie, for that wonderful description of the work you've done there. And now we move to Rod Smith on the Friends of Urambo and Wanhala, for which I'll be sharing my screen again. Okay. Uh, Rod, would you like to start talking while I bring you the yeah, screen? Yeah. Hello, hello, everybody, and thank you for, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, I'll try and be quick because I, I'm conscious we've uh, gone on a long time. Uh, the some of you, well, I hope all of you have read the newsletter. I wrote a little bit in that, um, and so uh, it saves me saying a lot of things. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Uh, as you see, we've been going for a very long time. We work exclusively in the Tabora region, uh, and we, our origin was from the Freedom From Hunger campaign way back in the 60s, when we adopted two... two uh, well, a Rambo farming, a farm, was a part of the ill-fated groundnut scheme, and uh, Moinhala was a agricultural research station. They were both taken over by us and turned into folk development colleges. Now, we've heard quite a lot about vocational education, and almost the poor man of vocational education have been folk development colleges, uh, of which we support three now. We've adopted the one in Sikonge as well. Uh, and they do specialise in giving uh, skills for life, uh, just as Willie was talking about carpentry and masonry and all that sort of stuff, uh, to young people. And they don't require much in the way of edu prior educational attainment either. Uh, and I would just say that just recently, in the last year, there has been a huge amount of money Tanzanian government has put into these colleges. All three of our colleges have had very large building programs, completely new dormitories and classrooms and things and offices. Uh, whereas before they've been very run down, they're now terribly smart. And they have very large numbers in comparison, sort of over 200 students each uh, studying all these things. So we we, we tr try and help with agriculture, although less so these days, lots about health and education. It was education that brought me into this um, when as a, having been a VSO volunteer myself and then becoming a, 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 a physics teacher, uh, stupidly or happily, I decided to take a party of school kids in 1984 when it wasn't really done out into Tanzania to uh, install a water project. That was in Wanhala. <laughs> I thought it was a one-off, but here I am still promoting things in Tanzania. Next slide, please. Uh, so there we are, there's the, what we do, but we also have moved into health in a big way, and we now support 15 village clinics, which is quite a strain for us. Uh, we're, not a, we're not a rich organization, but uh, that's what it is. Next slide, please. Uh, but what we're on now, our main, our main thrust, and this chimes in with what was said earlier on, uh, and I'll say a bit about it, is water supplies. Uh, with, with, I don't know whether it's global warming, I suspect it is, but whereas before, when I first went to Tanzania, virtually everybody, uh, all the villages were supplied with shallow wells. Now, these are wells which go down to about 10 metres. They're hand dug uh, and sealed over the top with a pump. And they work fine. They're really good. The, the water's good quality because it filters through the sand into the, into the well. But as the, uh, as the water table goes down, as the dry season progresses, eventually the water falls below the level of the pump intake. 
And what people tend to do, desperate for water, and you can understand this, they tend to take the top off the well, climb down the well themselves to scrape the water out from the bottom. The trouble with that is the, very often the top doesn't get put back, the pump gets damaged or lost, and the whole well becomes unusable. Uh, so shallow wells being unreliable, we've moved into the installation of much better and much more expensive water supplies. Uh, geophysical surveys can show where you can sink a borehole, and typically the boreholes go down about 100 metres. Uh, or if that's not possible, we have to look at other schemes. We'll have a look at that now in the next slide. There we are. This is... This is the holding tank for a very large rainwater harvesting scheme in Nyasa village. Uh, as you can see, it holds a lot of water and that's, that's been capped. It's got a solar powered pump on it, which pumps the water up into a holding, holding tank. And there it is for use. Next slide. This is the drilling rig in our latest borehole at Isigenhi village in Zega district. Uh, that's gone down 120 meters and amazingly has a yield of eight cubic meters an hour, which is an enormous amount of water for a village, much too much for one village. We've fitted it with a hand pump. Yes, please. There's the hand pump, uh, the Afri, Afri Dev, I think it's called design. That's the, the Isigeni Clinic nurse getting clean water. This is a delight for everybody. Um, eventually that will get replaced with a so with a, an electric pump a solar powered electric pump and a holding tank and standpipes around the village but we haven't got the money for that at the moment that will come and the next slide going quickly um we do we do get into building projects we've built a number of clinics uh we're about to start one in Kilalani, which is in rambo uh we've just finished one in mbali village in in, in zega district and we ensure that these clinics have a water supply. Uh, so we're in, in Kilalani, we're building the clinic and we're simultaneously installing a, a water supply, thanks to our wonderful members who give the money. But we are very limited in what we can do. Next, next uh, slide, please. There we are. That's about it. Um, you can check us out on our website if you like. Uh, can I just say something about toilets, which you just mentioned? They are a big problem, uh, and uh, not only in secondary schools, but in primary schools as well. And the trouble is they're rather unglamorous. If you ask people to <laughs> subscribe for a, 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 a water supply for a clinic, they go, oh, yes, that's jolly good. But if you say, I want to build some pit latrines, they're not so keen, and you can understand why. Um, but they are a... A, a problem, the lack of toilets. So somebody just asked the question, is it possible to install these uh, hand drilled wells all, all over Tanzania? Well, we did used to do that, used to did, did used to drill hand drill wells, but we found you couldn't get deep enough. They were in the end no better than shallow wells in the sort of geology we have in Tabora, which is all very hard granite based rock, which is why we go for mechanical um, motor driven deep boreholes which at least once they are working you can rely on them working more or less forever well forever as far as my lifetime is concerned so that's about it thank you very much thank you rod and thank you to everybody who has given us a presentation this afternoon because that draws them now to the close so we now move on to the business of the agm and the first matter is the approval of the minutes of the last AGM, which was held on Saturday, the 24th of October, 2020. I hope those who have wanted to have been able to see them in the annual report. Sorry, Elizabeth, do you want to stop recording now? Yes, please. It's, it's you recording. It's me recording, isn't it? <laughs> so 